So good evening everyone and welcome also to those of you who are joining the live stream online. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and obviously to welcome Sir Peter Bazalgette for his lecture on creative industries and innovation in the centenary of the birth of Anthony Burgess. I'm very proud that the University of Manchester and indeed the city and the region of Manchester have a long and distinguished record of achievement in fields where creativity is absolutely key. It might in fact be said that this is the common element in research across our three faculties. We decided some time ago to create university platforms which run across all schools and all disciplines. We have digital futures, we have sustainable futures and the next, of course, Creative Manchester. This is, of course, the home of creativity in the university, the School of Arts, Languages and Cultures, I believe one of the largest in the country. And of course, we're very proud to be the UNESCO City of Literature. But I firmly believe that creativity is a part of everything we do in a university. I think good science is creative, good engineering is creative, and actually, it's such an important part of all of our lives. We have some very famous alumni, we have some very famous staff and students, and indeed it's lovely that our former Chancellor Lem Sisse is now joining us as an honorary professor. Of course, there are many examples uh, of successes coming from this school. Um, for example, Anthony Burgess, theatre director Vicky Featherstone, uh, writing at the Royal Court Theatre, and of course screenwriter Jesse Armstrong, creator of the hit TV shows Fresh Meat and Succession, and a whole series of comedians, actors, writers, performers, of which I'm extremely proud. We've always been a place where we want to foster new talent and, and research, and where we want to feed into the creative economy. Baz knows very well that I have a bit of a platform with politicians. I can say this because I'm a scientist, but I'm extremely worried with the single-minded uh, fascination with science and technology. Important though it is, I believe we ignore social sciences, humanities, and creative activities at our peril. There's much talk in this country about levelling up. What better means to level up than through creative activities? You won't necessarily find many biologists or engineers in some of the poorer districts around us, but I bet you'll find very talented painters, writers, musicians, dancers, artists of very different sorts. And so what better way to level up than to use creative activities? We're very pleased, of course, to have some really important facilities, this theatre, indeed, uh, and of course our work with Art Gallery, award-winning, and our museum closed at the moment but open again soon to display our South Asia gallery and our Chinese gallery. We work a lot with partners across the region and I'm also very proud that, um, again we've discussed this previously, that even during the harshest times of the recession, and let's hope we don't have another one soon, but I'll keep up politics for tonight, um, the, this region continued to invest heavily in creative activities and Factory Manchester is, is due to open soon. And I'm very proud that that was the case. Obviously, Creative Manchester is a research platform, and with its partners, it will be addressing all sorts of important issues around, for example, um, net zero and sustainability, and race and justice, and particularly with our new Chancellor, Nazir Afsal. We'll launch the region's new creative health strategy at the Whitworth Gallery with our partners in the NHS and Greater Manchester Combined Authority. So this is an important event for us, not just for the School of Arts, Languages and Cultures, but also for the university more widely, because creativity and creative industries are extremely important to us. And should we think uh, that there is anything more than it being inherently important, it also makes a great deal of money for this city region and for this country. So my job here is to introduce Sir Peter Bazalgette, Baz, as everybody knows him, who was appointed University of Manchester Honorary Professor of Creative Industries in 2019 and delivered his inaugural lecture in March 2020. Peter was knighted in 2012 for services to broadcasting and he's currently, although I think just finishing, non-executive chairman of ITV, yes, but he has now taken up the role of chair of the Royal College of Art. Um, so we were just discussing all the trials and tribulations of the higher education sector, not least wondering what on earth our government is going to um, uh, bring to us next, but we shall see. Uh, he's had many other roles. He sits as a non-executive on the board of UK Research and Innovation and chair of the Creative Industries Council. 
We're privileged to have him as a colleague in the university, and we eagerly await his lecture, Innovation, Growth, and the Creative Industries. And after that, uh, Dr. Abby Gilmore will give a short response. So, a very warm welcome to Peter Bazalgette, Baz. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. Nancy, thank you very much for your very generous introduction. I always like to hear a scientist uh, espouse a breadth of education and talk in the way you did, in that Catholic way, that is Catholic with a small c, by the way, Catholic way about the uh, education and the breadth uh, that we should uh, um, adopt. Um, can I say thank you very much for this lovely graphic? This Rodanesque figure with its VR goggles on. Somebody asked earlier, is that based on you? And I said, I was very flattered by the question, <laughs> but I said, I'm far too flabby at my age to, to be anything like that. But it, it's rather, rather a groovy um, image, so thank you. Um, now, thank you so much uh, for my Im invitation this evening to Creative Manchester. And I think today we're celebrating Creative Manchester as being recognized officially as a university-wide interdisciplinary research platform, along with the likes of sustainable futures and digital futures. And I think, since that's happening, it's worth a round of applause for that, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. There's nothing I like more than spontaneous applause. But why? Why would it be that it's being a, 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 a officially recognised now as a, as a research platform in that way? I'd argue because Manchester, Britain's second most creative city after London, some would argue Britain's most creative city, we won't have that debate tonight, but Manchester knows how important the creative sector is to our future wealth, health and happiness. I learned a lot about this city when I chaired Arts Council England a few years ago. I found a city council committed to the value of culture and a world-leading university for science, which also understood the importance of the creative industries and um, its role in stimulating them, as Nancy has just demonstrated. Plus, I found a belief in the role of culture in placemaking. The first thing to appear in the now thriving Salford campus, we should all remember, was actually the Lowry Theatre. That was before Media City took shape. And just before I stepped down from ACE, uh, as we call the Arts Council, we voted through the investment for the factory, which Nancy alluded to just now. So this place is always on the front foot when it comes to our sector, the creative sector. So what I want to unpack tonight, and I look forward to a debate, questions and answers afterwards. Um, I'll be very interested to hear your views too. What I want to unpack is how in the future the Northwest can help lead the human face of our current industrial revolution. In this brave new digital world, the creative industries can deliver economic growth and jobs, that's the wealth. But our sector is also, as I indicated, a placemaker and a cultural barometer, and thus drives physical and mental health. That's the health bit, and then creative output also defines our values, it's part of the social glue. I think, actually, you, are, you should argue on which our happiness depends, so that's the happiness. Wealth, health, and happiness. So there you are, I've only been speaking for about a minute and I'm making all these lofty claims. But just for a moment, to back up those lofty claims, consider the trusted news that informs our democracy, the fiction in all media that enriches our national conversation, the video games which entertain us, the designers and architects who shape our cities, our transport and our buildings, the advertisers and marketers who reflect our culture while stimulating and supporting our commercial brands. The theatres and museums which both define place and drive tourism. The cultural exports which drive our soft power. More broadly, the rock upon which our humane education is built and the means by which we nurture empathetic citizens. So although much of what I'm going to say tonight is about economic growth, <coughs> let's never please forget that our sector is about so much more than that. Now, the word growth was very much to the fore in the, I might say, entirely uncontroversial mini-budget delivered by our new Chancellor ten days ago. Uh, our, uh, the stable mini-budget, we could say, it changes it, doesn't it, by the second. And uh, that Chancellor, that figure who delivered it, he looked familiar. Where had we seen it before? Yes, I think it was in a previous government, judging by the pace of events, you might even say a previous life. Quasi had been the Bayes Minister. 
While he was doing that job, they produced a document in the summer of 2021 called Build Back Better Plan for Growth. It identified six priority sectors for the growth of our economy, and the creative industries was one of them. There are good reasons for this. As we know, the sector was growing three times faster than the economy in general up to 2019, reaching a value of £115 billion, and that was 6% of our GVA. A contraction during COVID, certainly, but now bouncing back strongly again. In that same year, we also know the creative industries accounted for more than £50 billion pounds worth of exports in, in products and services, which is an extraordinary number and too much of a well-kept secret. So if the Chancellor wants growth, our sector is definitely delivering it. And it strikes me there are two sorts of growth. I'm straying slightly outside my territory here uh, into the field of economics, but I did do it at A-level. 50 years ago. Um, there are two sorts of growth, I think. There's consumer-led spending, which I think seems to be one of the current aims of the current government. Uh, and I'm not going to enter a minefield debate about the merits, genuinely, of his, of his mini-budget. But on the other hand, there's the growth that comes from investment in R&D-led innovation. It's the latter I'm talking about today because I think it's the only genuine way in the end, out of what some people are calling stagflation nation. Anyway, despite the impressive numbers of the creative industries, the truth is we're not yet taken as seriously as other sectors. This is partly because we only defined ourselves 25 years ago. In 1997, we had the news, if you like, of a brand new birth. To the United Kingdom, a new sector is born. We welcome the creative industries to the world. And it was to the world because we were the first country ever to define such a sector. The promising infant thrived and was soon being measured by the ONS via nine key sub-sectors, advertising and marketing, architecture, crafts, design and designer fashion, film, TV, video, radio, photography, IT, software and computer games, publishing, museums, galleries, libraries, music performing, and visual arts. And a useful, economically slanted definition was added Industries which have their origin in individual creativity, skill and talent, and which have a potential for wealth and job creation through the generation and exploitation of intellectual property. Now, in the years since, you could call it our adolescence, if you like, we moved on by measuring the output of the sector, set up the Creative Industries Council, and then Creative UK as our lobbying and policy body. So why do I say not taken seriously enough? Well, a few months ago, I conducted a survey which shows you what I mean. I looked at media mentions of five important sectors over a month. Life sciences, automotive, aerospace, oil and gas, and the creative industries. And I didn't pick the sectors at random, because in 2019, the creative industries were worth more than those other sectors put together. And rather like the Eurovision Song Contest, the results are now in. Life sciences was mentioned 278 times. Aerospace, 494 times. Automotive, 537 times. Oil and gas, 742 two times. No surprise there in, in the current energy crisis. The creative sector, 55 times. Now, it was just a straw poll. But what I'm getting at is that a media mention of a sector in general is indicative of the public consideration and perceived importance of the sector. And our sector, despite its value and growth, is still a bit of a well-kept secret. We all have work to do. I did do something out of a little bit sense of devilry. Into that survey, I added fishing. And fishing came top with 945 mentions. Now look, I enjoy line court sea bass as much, as much as any other person. But actually, in terms of priorities, indicated by media mentions, isn't that just a little bit depressing? I think so. I'd say that we over-inform ourselves on traditional declining sectors such as manufacturing, important though they are, and we under-inform ourselves on growth sectors such as ours. So in the future, we're going to need to improve the data which is going to feed into our policy making. Some find it hard to get to grips with the sector, which contains everything from sustainable textiles to augmented reality apps, and one which has some very big companies, but also many, many SMEs. But that is the knowledge economy for you. Our national mindset is still too rooted in old certainties, and I think we've got a long way to go to wake up to new realities. Skills, we're told, 
is one of the three engines of growth as defined by Bayes. But our national industrial and employment classifications are still based on older models that fail to capture an accurate picture of our dominant service industries. There's been some good work done on this, by the way, by the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, which, as you know, Manchester University is a partner, but much more to do. You may have heard a rather sobering prediction recently from Dell Technologies. They posited that 85, 80, I think it was 83% of the job descriptions we'll be using in 2030 have yet to be invented. Now, that 83% is a slightly spurious number, isn't it? It sounds rather dubious. Let's, let's say it may not be 83%, but let's say it's just 50%. I think there's some truth in the idea of how fast things are changing and how slow we are possibly to respond. But I do think we need to look to sunrise sectors such as our own to imagine and generate those new roles. As I pointed out in my 2017 review of the creative industries, which I carried out for a government that now seems to be a distant memory, uh, the million jobs I said at the time that creative industries could deliver in the, in the following decade would be durable and high value in contrast to other sectors where AI and automation will be destroying whole, sec whole occupations. I actually said that in a letter to the FT, and I included in um, occupations that will be destroyed by AI um, some surgeons, you know, and their technical equipment. And the surgeon wrote back to the FT very, very angry with me because he couldn't imagine being replaced by a machine. But anyway, I think I, I may have a point. The thing is, you need people for creativity. And that brings me to Manchester, which has an abundance of both, creativity and people. Creative Manchester is gearing up at a propitious time. Manchester has a five billion digital economy and is a leading AI base. The creative sector alone is annually worth 1.4 billion to the city's economy. In the wider area, creative, digital and tech already employs 86,000 people. And startups are plentiful, with business births a third above the national average. We were talking earlier, weren't we, Nancy, about the number of job vacancies there are in this city, which is an indication of the economic growth here and how when you talk about a nation in recession, it isn't always applicable to the whole nation because I think Manchester is far from being in recession. Universities and research institutes are critical to our future economy and so the partnerships here between industry, local government and academia are not only fruitful but hugely important to future growth. And that's the durable R&D-led growth I identified earlier. Now, I also gave you a lament about statistics, uh, that is, the poverty of the statistics by which we measure sunrise sectors. So all credit to the University of Manchester Creative Radar data that tells us that last year the city had 8,386 creative businesses, it's a very precise number, of which a third, and this is significant too, were in clusters. I'll have rather more in a minute to say about clusters. These uh, break down across our subsectors with the most in design, advertising and uh, design, then advertising and marketing, music and the performing arts, and TV plus video. I was interested that the four biggest concentrations were in the city, but Salford had the fifth and that Rochdale is very strong in publishing, which of course one can say no wonder Manchester is now the UNESCO city of literature. The university is giving a lead in a number of ways. Your Centre for Cultural Value has assembled a national consortium of researchers to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the UK's cultural sector. And creative sector startups such as Music in Mind feature in the university's growing spin-out programme, the Innovation Factory. Creative Manchester, uh, as I think you indicated in your introduction, Nancy, has decided upon three strands going forward, innovation, civic and creative futures, and health and well-being. I think these are really judiciously selected and do point the way to the yawning opportunities the creative sector has going forward. The symbiosis between research excellence and innovative SMEs is well known, and now we're demonstrating that the creative industries is genuinely an R&D sector, as much as, say, life sciences, fintech, or green energy. For instance, we're only tiptoeing at the threshold of uh, VR and AR. The um, innovative nexus where creative design meets tech, which some of us are now calling createch, is going to create huge economic and cultural value in the next decade. Though once again, our current definitions of R&D are out of date. 
Much of the R&D we do in our sector is not captured by the statistics and doesn't qualify under the current definitions for tax credits. So anyway, a big tick to that first priority, innovation. Then civic and creative futures underlines the critical role culture plays in placemaking, to which I've already alluded. And where health and well-being are concerned, We've finally got social prescribing off the ground and more widely understood. That dance can prevent fractures in elderly people. That singing can assist lung function. That participating in arts activities can be far more efficacious and cheaper than the prescription of anti-depression drugs. Um, when I was at the Arts Council in the very early days of social prescribing, we uh, funded a, a practice, a GP practice in Gloucestershire to stop prescribing antidepressants and encourage people to take part in arts activities in the locality. And the GP who was doing it after a few months said to me that he thought he had more evidence social prescribing work than he'd ever been given that Prozac worked, which I thought was a really interesting uh, analysis. So I'm delighted that Creative Manchester has chosen to concentrate on those three categories. Now, I said I'd return to the subject of clusters. The creative industries naturally gives birth to clusters. Screen industries in Manchester and Cardiff. Fashion in Leeds. Video games in Dundee. Publishing again in Manchester, as we've heard, and so on. Nesta has identified 47 of these organic clusters in our sector, where talent gravitates, where higher education nurtures qualified graduates and spin-outs, where arts and culture are backed by national agencies and local government, spilling over innovators from the public sector into commercial enterprises. The chief recommendation of my 2017 report for the government about growing creative industries was that we invest in creative clusters. Unusually for a recommendation in an official report, miraculous even, we managed to get the idea taken up and invested in by UK Research and Innovation. Some 50 million pounds was put into the best nine applications. They cover many of our subsectors, and four years on, they're flourishing. Extraordinarily, more than £200 million of matched funding has been attracted by that £50 million that went in from, from, from uh, UKRI. Research excellence from universities has been connected with SMEs in concrete ways. More than 600 SMEs, in fact. All in all, we've seen 36,000 businesses engaged, and more than 900 of them have attracted funding for R&D. Let me give you a flavour of some of the R&D-led innovation going on in the nine clusters. The Future Fashion Factory in Leeds is creating new sustainable materials. Creative Informatics in Edinburgh is exploring what data-driven AI looks like for the creative businesses. In York, they're inventing new ways of delivering screen narratives via 5G. In Glasgow, they're demonstrating how to exploit uh, VR for industrial training. In Bristol, they have a virtual AR robot that's eating parts of the city. It is only virtual, I repeat. In Belfast, they're inventing new approaches to virtual production. Now, you'll tell me that you can rival all these initiatives and more in Manchester, and I believe you can. So you're also demonstrating that clusters are a key, if not the key, to growing our sector. They rely on local knowledge and expertise, exemplified by the beneficial partnership between industry, universities, and local government. National government pays lip service to SMEs, but can't really get to grips with thousands of small companies. Locally empowered clusters are the answer. Where they benefit from academic input, they're increasingly research-driven, which is desperately needed. Because government, please take note once again, R&D will drive innovation and growth in our future economy. And the UK has not been doing very well up to now. Our R&D invested as a proportion of our GDP, as you may know, is around 1.7%. The real number may be higher because of the definitional problems I mentioned to you earlier. But countries like South Korea and Israel are, invest about three times more. There are now rumors of a new austerity from our, our, our new government, with R&D spending possibly reined in. That can't be right. It's the only way to get real long-term growth where small amounts of public money release much larger, larger business investment, as we've demonstrated with the creative clusters. Now, quite rightly, we heard a lot about levelling up from the last government. We await to see if it remains a priority of the new regime. But clusters are one of the keys to equitable economic growth. With their greater regional penetration and dynamic connectivity to SMEs, this is where industrial policy should be going, particularly for the creative sector. 
which is why the role of Creative Manchester and the goals it set itself are so welcome and so important. Now, as you said, Nancy, I currently co-chair the Creative Industries Council. I co-chair it with the new DCMS Secretary of State. She's only a few weeks into the job. She may not yet know she co-chairs it with me, but she does. Assuredly, she does. The Council is a joint body between the government and the sector, as you know, for promoting the interests of the sector. We're currently charged with writing something called a sector vision. This is intended as a policy framework for the next 10 years. We expect to publish it this autumn, and if I say too much about the content of it, I shall probably be put in the Tower of London. But I wanted to give you just a flavour of our direction of travel. We'll certainly be recommending the backing of clusters as a cornerstone of growth. It's good to know that DCMS's scale-up programme, investing in creative SMEs, will be continuing. And part of that will be what they're calling the Create Growth Programme, which I know Greater Manchester has applied to join, and I very much hope this area is successful. Innovate UK, as you know, is part of UKRI, and it has a declared intention of committing funds to the sector. This will also be important, as long as it's done through a strategic lens. I wait to hear more news on that. The working title of the sector vision is A Plan for Inclusive Growth. I've referred to the growth bit, now the inclusive bit. We're all aware we've much to do to improve access to our sector. If we're the beating heart of our culture, then we need to reflect all communities and draw on all talents. There's much to do to promote creative sector careers in schools and colleges. I found it salutary, if not a little depressing, to learn from a recent BFI study, British Film Institute study, that 41% of 16-year-olds polled didn't even know there are careers in the screen industries. This is at a time of unprecedented growth in screen. By the end of this year, we'll have more studio space than Hollywood. We're servicing the insatiable demand for drama from the streamers worldwide. And the studios are crying out for more makeup artists, carpenters, real-time game engineers, cinematographers, sound engineers, and so on. Screen Skills has estimated that the screen industry needs 17,000 new entrants in the next two years alone. It's certainly a challenge, but it is also a huge opportunity. And I'm very pleased to say it's one which the Factory Academy in Manchester is going to be addressing with its new training schemes. So we need to make sure all these opportunities are understood. We need to clarify career, pathway, career pathways and job descriptions for pupils at school. We need to make sure that further and higher education have the appropriate courses to deliver the skills needed. I'm very alarmed that the take-up of design and technology GCSE has shown a calamitous decline in the past decade. Calamitous. We have to address this. Believe me, if we don't de develop creativity skills in our children, we're lost. This is where the high-value jobs are going to be. The rest is just AI and parcel delivery. In the, I know that sounds bleak, but you know what I'm getting at. In this context, the Department of Education's new Future Skills Unit will be critical. And I'm impressed that a number of Greater Manchester's clusters are in more deprived areas. That will be one of the ways of opening up our sector to new talents. The third important element of the sector vision will be about maximizing the impact of our powerhouse of a sector. Its impact in places, in society in general, supporting our health and well-being, and in optimizing our exports and soft power abroad. I can't tell you any more now about the sector vision on pain of death, but we very much hope the sector vision can offer a practical and responsive policy framework for the next decade. Now, before the... Uh, epochal, I'd say, death of the Queen this summer, or this autumn, you may recall we were able to celebrate her life and service at the Platinum Jubilee in the summer. It already rather seems like history, doesn't it? Some of you may have been at Buckingham Palace for the event. If not, I'm sure many of you, like me, watched it, watched that concert on that uh, weekend uh, on TV. So who could forget the spectacular digital display in the darkness above the palace roof at the end of the ceremony. 400 drones were deployed in fluid formation to magically conjure up some inspiring imagery, culminating in the silhouette of a corgi. A surprisingly benign corgi, I thought. I've always found them rather yappy little dogs. But the sight of it and the whole demonstration, it amazed and delighted us all. The company behind it was Sky Magic, partly based in the UK and partly in Singapore. 
They get creative design to meet technology. Some, as I say, are calling this Createch. It represents a fusion of STEM disciplines and the humanities. It's not one or the other, as you rightly said, Nancy. You might think it is one or the other listening to some of our educational soothsayers still today, but it's not the line you or I take. Our global competitiveness will increasingly depend on the fusion of the two. Product design, service design, human-centered design, design engineering, these are critical for all sectors going forward. This nexus, if we make the right investments, will deliver huge cultural and economic value in the next decade. This is why I recently leapt at the chance, as you said, Nancy, to chair the Royal College of Art, where the likes of James Dyson and Thomas Heatherwick are graduates. They've been excelling at Createch before we even knew what it's called. At the college, they study as cohorts do in Manchester, robotics, mobility, inclusive design. If the Chancellor wants growth, this is how we can deliver it, harnessing our national creative gene to the rapid development of tech. And it can happen across the UK in clusters, and I believe Manchester is showing how. The message is getting out. We looked at uh, 38 local industrial strategies recently, and 35 of them featured the creative industries. And 70 of the 101 town fund bids have our sector as a primary or secondary priority. If a place has that fruitful combination of a research-led university or college, a committed local authority that gets it, and strong connections to local businesses, then I hope we'll also be seeing creative focus bids into the UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the Leveling Up Fund. If, if, if those parts of the jigsaw are there, they can be brought together in a powerful way. There's one other thing we've been slow to promulgate. I've said our sector is unique because it delivers cultural value as well as economic growth, but it's unique in another way. The creative industries at their best enable all the other sectors to excel. It's obvious but not often stated that advertising and marketing, for instance, powers the products and services of the nation. But increasingly, the creative sector contributes to supply chains everywhere. It's calculated that for every GVA pound earned in our own sector, within our sector, we also generate a further 50 pence elsewhere in the economy. So, in conclusion, this opportunity is a huge one. And I ha I'm happy to say to all of you tonight, go Creative Manchester. You've all the ingredients here for success. Show us what an R&D-led economy should look like. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Sir Peter Baz. Um, uh, and thank you uh, also. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to respond to, uh, to the keynote, to the words we've just heard. Um, uh, and I'd like to begin this response by thanking Sir Peter for his contribution to creative industries policy and research, and also offer personal thanks as this contribution has actually had a direct benefit to me and my research in the creative industries. Um, Sir Peter mentioned uh, the independent review of creative industries in 2017, and that directly led to the investment of funds for research to support R&D and innovation through the UKRI-funded Creative Economy Programme. We mentioned the Creative Cluster Funds, uh, the Creative Cluster um, uh, Research, and it also created the HRC Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, the PEC, of which I'm a part, along with my colleague, um, Bruce Tether, um, who is the research director of the PEC currently and our postdoc researcher, Claire Bernal Mayer. So, in response to uh, what we've just heard, I wanted to talk about some of the research that I've been involved in that's come out of the PEC that's got relevance to the keynote. Um, and the findings of, of this research is also supporting and in some ways challenging the discussion that we're having. So, two areas of research mainly one is around post COVID creative economies. What do we know about the impact of the pandemic on existing inequalities within the arts, cultural and creative industries? And the second piece of research is looking at creative industry strategies within the devolved city regions in England and the importance of place-based approaches, knowledge and understanding. And I'm going to argue that this research has implications for creative industries policy um, and also for innovation, growth and place probably won't do too much in terms of economics because uh, it's not my area. 
but I will end on some thoughts about where this might take us next for creative and cultural industries research here at Manchester. So the first project I wanted to talk about was a, um, a project I was a co-investigator on, the impact of COVID on the cultural industries. And this was funded by the UKI as an urgent call. It was led by Professor Ben Wormsley of the Centre for Cultural Value at the University of Leeds in partnership with the PEC. And it was the largest national study of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the arts and cultural sector in the UK. We did lots of mixed methods research. There was over 230 interviews, a labor force data analysis from the Office of National Statistics, social media analysis, five waves of a UK population survey led by the audience agency, and analysis of the cultural ecosystem of Greater Manchester, led by me. Um, and we found, as was commonly experienced by partner organizations to Creative Manchester um, and to the Institute for Cultural Practices, where I belong, uh, individual creatives and creative consumers, that there were a number of innovation effects that have implications from cultural and creative industries policies that came directly out of the pandemic. So firstly, and you may be very familiar with this, the idea of the pivot to digital and the agility to which organizations were able to reach out to audiences, communities and consumers with creative output through digital means. So we had examples, you know, the big national examples like National Theatre Live, which proved a major success, um, but also much smaller organizations with far fewer resources who did what they could to deliver their missions online. For example, trying to create the atmosphere and opportunities to showcase new talent in film, com comedy and other arts festivals, or engaging museum visitors in digitized collections through COVID safe digital trails in parks and green spaces. The second kind of innovation effect, if you like, was the idea of the pivot to the civic. And we write about this in the report that, uh, on the project Culture in Crisis, which is already published. Um, uh, and there'll be more on the project in an, uh, a forthcoming book from Manchester University Press. So the pivot to the civic is that idea that, um, that Baz referenced, you know, the kind of caring of the cultural sector, the extraordinary caring and expertise that arts and cultural organizations showed to their constituents and to the people around them who were lonely or isolated or bereft of social activities during lockdown. We saw art centers and museums become online community centers and sources for home education. Theater groups organized food banks and creative care kits like here in Greater Manchester. And this adaptability was often in partnership with local authorities and the third sector, and also with private enterprise, enterprises who were hard, equally hard hit. We saw, for example, new beers with artwork designed for free, such as Seven Brothers King of the North beer, which celebrated Andy Burnham, with proceeds donated to hospital and uh, the event sector. And earlier today, when we were talking with our um, MA Arts Management students, um, we referenced whether or not food should be part of the creative economy. And I very much argue that craft beer has all the kinds of characteristics that means it should be included within this sector. Importantly, there were local policy innovations, such as um, in Greater Manchester, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority launched United We Stream, which put content up online and, and, and brought people in to play and entertain people in their homes to raise funds for arts and creative freelancers. And that's now a new community interest company that's trialing this new business model to get the GM brand out there. And of course, we saw um, from Arts Council England and other arts funders, national and local, the way that they relaxed their eligibility criteria and to stabilize um, organizations that had no, no other income. And the largest single injection of public money into creative and cultural industries through the 1.57 billion create, uh, cultural recovery fund which included not just organizations who already got funding through the state, but also managed to reach out to private sector organizations who'd never accessed public funding before. However, the findings of the research were not wholly positive. And we found that the pandemic also held up a mirror to a deeply unequal cultural sector. The most dramatic decline in the cultural industry's workforce was observed in the music, performing, and visual arts part of the creative industries, where the professional workforce fell by around a quarter between March and June 2020, with no signs of significant recovery by the end of 2020 in comparison with other sectors. Other sectors in the creative industries, as defined by the DCMS, didn't suffer in the same way. 
So according to the Labour Force Survey analysis that was conducted by my colleagues Dave O'Brien, Mark Taylor and Tal Fader and their team, the numbers who are um, working in the IT and related services bounced back over the course of 2020. And those who were working in creative occupations in advertising, marketing, film and TV actually grew over the course of, of the year. However, even within these sectors, the impact of the pandemic was not experienced evenly across the sector, with younger workers, women, and workers from ethnically diverse backgrounds amongst the hardest hit in terms of losing work and income. For freelancers, as many of us know, um, who, who make up the mo a significant part of the cultural workforce, force, the impact was major and sometimes devastating. Freelancers constituted 62% of the core creative workforce before the pandemic and only 52% by the end of 2020. And the policy response was just not enough. Um, we also found out things around kind of inequalities with uh, arts audiences. Um, so the project through the audience agency survey um, monitored the pop through a population survey, ordinary people, not existing arts audiences, to see what they were doing during the pandemic and look at what their likely return to creative consumption was and look at the way that they, they participated digitally. And this found that although there are some signs that participation online during the pandemic helped some marginalised groups, such as people with disabilities, actually, in the main, it was the same people who were already involved in cultural consumption with a distinct bias towards educated, affluent and white populations who were actually taking part. The second area of research I want to talk about briefly, and I'll try to keep this short because um, I would like to open up discussion, um, was, is, is uh, research that's been led by those who are at the PEC in Manchester, which is looking at the geographies of creative industries in the Greater Manchester area. And you heard some reference to some of the data um, from this earlier in, in Sir Peter's speech. And this is in the context of uh, the, the industrial strategy, which was the kind of thing that happened before levelling up. And we now wait to see uh, whether uh, there's going to be a return to some of the policies that have come out of it. So one project um, that I was involved in with a uh, previous postdoc, Zoe Belatis, was uh, about how national creative industries policies play out at a regional level. And to this, um, to, to, to look at this, we looked at the contents and narratives found in the policy documents um, in relation to local industrial strategy pilots in Greater Manchester and West Midlands, so those two big second city regions. And we also looked at, and we did a discourse analysis of the uh, policy document penned by Sir Peter, the Independent Sector Review. Um, and so using discourse and, and histor historical analysis, we traced how different policy actors shaped the different devolved strategies found within these two places. And we, enter, we identified different and distinctive approaches which reflected their political, cultural, and spatial characteristics in interesting ways. You can probably guess some of this, but I'm going to, just going to tell you some of the, the distinctions. So for Greater Manchester, the creative industries policy discourses were very much following previous narratives of the first industrial modern city, the driving force behind the northern powerhouse, the Manchester model for devolution. And the strategy clearly identified the growth of, you know, the importance of digital creative and media to economic growth and driving productivity. I, and identifying multiple creative and cultural industries clusters, including Media City, but also other, other places, and putting kind of places like the factory and its investment at the kind of heart of its strategy. It also referred quite distinctly to the other towns and places in the city region and also to other more cultural and heritage type, type activities. Birmingham and the West Midlands industrial strategy was rather different. The narratives there were of more recent growth linked to the region's role as a central transport hub, its industrial heritage in terms of car manufacturing and the promised investment in, uh, through connectivity. In fact, creative industries were not actually mentioned as a specific sector within the local industrial strategy document, although there was reference to the importance of creative content, techniques, and technologies in driving innovation and the development of other industries. So the focus wasn't really on place in, West Mid in the West Midlands, but more about the transferability of culture and creativity that are seen as agents for innovation and productivity rather than of value in their own right. And so it was interesting to look how, how distinctive these, these strategies were from each other. 
and it suggests something about how these strategy documents become kind of boundary objects which can tailor national policy and create place-based approaches that have a potential better fit with local geography and creative and cultural ecosystems. The final, thing, uh, final piece of research I wanted to mention was one that we've heard about earlier, and this is a piece of research by Bruce Tether, which drew on the creative radar data, uh, which was developed by um, Nesta, but um, augmented this to look at um, NOMAS business survey data and to try to map um, the creative industries within Greater Manchester. And this paper has just recently been published on the PEC website, so you can go and look at it and read it in, in full there. And um, this kind of data analysis and mapping looks, um, Bruce mapped uh, the creative industries and the clusters onto particular indices of wealth and deprivation across the city region. And he finds that there's a really strong presence of creative clusters, unsurprisingly, in the city centre in, in Salford Keys, and then a range of smaller clusters that go down the south and southwesterly part towards Cheshire. However, the distribution of creative enterprises is very uneven, and particularly weak in places with higher levels of de deprivation in the conurbation. And he argues that in many ways, Manchester reproduces at city regional level the inequalities that exist across the UK as a whole. In the context of levelling up, the central policy challenge is to enhance opportunities in those kind of left behind places, those poor and deprived spaces, where currently creative clusters don't exist. So I'm going to finish on just raising some questions about what the implications of this research are, might be for policies that, for creative and cultural industries. And firstly, I wanted to make the observation that it shouldn't take research in a crisis to identify issues of inequality. However, these are, the, these are our times. We seem to be going, we'll be going to the next crisis, which is the cost of living crisis, of course, and that's going to have a huge impact on arts and cultural venues and on uh, creative industries in all kinds of ways. The second observation is connected to the idea of spillovers and clusters and the dominant thinking about how to kind of create uh, benefits and stimulate and distribute benefits from the clustering of activities that tend to um, uh, map onto social groups and localities that already have advantage. So the inequalities that exist and the ways that these are meted out socially and spatially need to be addressed. We need to pay attention to the structural inequalities that exist that make some socioeconomic groups more likely to suffer from precarious work, low pay and insecurity, and which prevent access to both production and consumption. As, as Peter said, creative industries are our people and we need to look after our people. We need to look after our workers. We also need to take into account the characteristics and distinctions of place, which affect the success of instrumental policies aimed at realizing economic, social, and public good from creativity and culture. By temporarily equalizing everyone's access to cultural production and consumption, the pandemic revealed some of the inequalities that pre-existed, but it also revealed thing that things can happen differently and provide an opportunity to reset and regroup. However, the current return to discourses of trickle-down economics is deeply concerning and fundamentally undermines the value that engaging in creativity and culture has for society. This has the potential to undo all the good work and fine principles of the industrial strategy, levelling up, the northern powerhouse, and so on, that highlighted the importance of place-based approaches, collaboration with new institutions, and the redistribution of resources. There are other ways to think about this. New models such as foundational eco economics, donut and circular economies, which suggest that there are different ways to realize value than trickle down and out, agglomeration and competition between places for scarce resources. They emphasize the combination of welfare, utility and market forces within creative economies alongside everyday cultural consumption and cultural value. And so I would argue we need to pay attention to these to support fairer redistributive policies for fairer, more just creative and cultural industry sectors and a fairer, more just, productive and innovative society. Thank you. So I want to ask um, to Peter back up here and he is available for questions. So, uh, as, in, as indeed are comments. you. I might no, I mean, after it's a really interesting presentation you just made, I have to say. So I think, you know, there may be points about uh, what I said, but there may be points about what you said, I think. Yeah, anyway. Okay.
Okay, at the back. Oh, and please, um, could you speak into the microphone for the people at home? Hello, um, I'm Andy Miles. I'm a professor of sociology here, and um, thank you both for your presentations. I found them very interesting. I wanted to just um, come back to where Abby finished off with, in, which was really about um, structural inequalities in our society and how creative industries, arts and culture fits into those, uh, into that, uh, around that issue going forward. And I wanted also to sort of, I want to go Thank back you. to Sir Peter's point about fishing. Um, <laughs> so, and, and to shout out for fishing here, because um, I, I, I thought you were a little bit disparaging about the, the potential value of fishing. Um, but bear with me. And the reason I say that is I think that um, one of the things my research and Abby, Abby's research too, along with me, shows is, is that the, the, the creative industry sector, the cultural sector generally, tends often not to understand ordinary people's cultural preferences. And I think it's very indicative that you found that a lot of people enjoy fishing. And um, I think, it, I wonder what you have to say about how far um, the cultural industries, creative industries, approach to those kinds of participation which fall out of uh, Arts Council remit, which are not, perhaps not quite as appreciated as they might be, including for their creativity. Um, maybe explain some of the problems we have in recruiting people from excluded groups, working class groups, ethnic minority groups, to the kinds of exciting uh, opportunities for creative work in the future. Thank you. Um, look, uh, I wasn't talking about people, uh, um, people's uh, pastime fishing, which is a very fine thing. In fact, I think it's the biggest participatory, if you call it sport, in the country. Mm -hmm. I was talking about differently defined industrial, sec uh, industrial and commercial sectors, one of which is the fishing industry. And uh, we all like to eat fish, and the communities that, f the, the much diminished communities that still fish uh, within the ecological guidance uh, still today are a very small and not very significant industry in this country, and that was the point I was making. So let there be no misunderstanding about that. However, your broader point uh, is a very good one, and you raise some really interesting questions. Um, of course, the bulk of the creative sector doesn't get people's tastes wrong at all. It sells them massive amounts and, and asks them to participate in massive amounts of culture. I'm talking about popular culture, which I've spent my entire life in, because I've worked in television for 40 years. But um, it is true that in um, what you might call, or some people call, a publicly supported arts, the sort of organizations funded by the Arts Council, where I was chair for four years, I think you make a very a valid and powerful point. Um, I used to love um, street festivals in places like um, uh, Durham and, um, and um, uh, uh, Stockton on Tees because it seemed to me half the population never go into museums or theatres because they think they don't belong there. They think they, they, they think they might not be welcome there. They think that they might not um, know what to do there. That's not right, but, but it's true. And the thing about street festivals is that they belong to everybody because the space belongs to everybody and everybody feels welcome there. And I found them far more effective in terms of participation. Um, and so I think there, in, in popular culture, I, I think what you say is, is not so, but in um, uh, publicly supported arts, it does sometimes seem very elitist, I agree. And I think it's a, a, a really good challenge and should always be a, a consistent challenge. And then when you come to employment, your point is valid across all of the creative sector. <laughs> um, because, um, you know, if uh, the creative sector is the beating heart of our culture, then it has to draw on all talents and all communities. Well, it just doesn't do that at the moment. It fails to do so. And we need really coherent strategies to correct that. Um, and that starts uh, Jesuitically with, uh, with kids at school. Uh, and it starts with defining better career pathways. And it also goes on to very important initiatives for 
uh, uh, equality and access in larger employers, and we've done a lot of work on that in ITV, but let me be frank, we have a long way to go, too. Um, so I think the broad points you raise are, are good ones, and, and you sh people like you and everybody should challenge, challenge, challenge on this, because we have to do better. Thank you. There's a question down here at the front and then behind. So you just got your hand up just first. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Eliza. I'm a deputy director for the PEC and I'm based at Nesta. Um, and it's really interesting to hear you talk about sort of city and regional growth strategies. And, and I've been thinking a lot about soft power. And I wonder whether you think that cities and regions need soft power strategies in that they need to be thinking about the story that they're telling, the simplified story they're telling about themselves to the outside world, or whether they should focus solely on their sort of internal strategies and sort of the uh, complex growth strategy that you need within a city as well as the story they're turn it, telling externally. Goodness me, that's interesting. I've not thought of it like that before. Um, let me just unpack that. So soft power, as we refer to it, as it were, British culture going abroad and influencing the world, and perhaps, um, as we know, where, where arts and culture goes, trade often follows. And of course, soft power has a lot to do with education and educational exchanges, which we were, we were talking about just before we came in the room. Um, I'm not quite sure how that refers um, or, or, or matches or, or maps across the idea of a region or even a city. Um, it is true, though, that um, cities and regions have to brand themselves if they're going to attract investment, industry, if the universities in them are going to attract the best students, who are then going to, you know, what, 30, 40% of the students are going to stay in the area for five years and create businesses, more even, Nancy, right? Um, so um, I think it's a really interesting idea because, I mean, those regions have their market, you know, if you look, ask them, the council and the LEP about their strategy, they have their strategy, but do they brand it? I think that's your challenge, and I think it's a really good one. I think it could be much better done. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And of course, we can feed in the raw material to that, can't we? Yeah, interesting. Um, sorry, there was a question behind, and then, sorry, Nancy, did you want to come back on that straight away? Yeah, sorry, if you could, please. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's actually not a question, it, it, it's, a, it's a for me. Sorry, there was somebody just before you. Uh, sorry, Bjorn. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Hello, uh, Mariana. Uh, I'm a, a lecturer in digital innovation. Um, I have a question about Korea Tech. Uh, so, uh, kind of like illustrated by this wonderful <laughs> picture. Uh, strange man, yes. Yes. Uh, well, the new technologies are a bit strange in the form of um, to work in virtual reality, augmented reality, and um, haptics, artificial intelligence, all this kind of new creative fields. Uh, usually, people need both expertise in uh, STEM and in uh, creative disciplines. Um, the issues that many uh, small companies and many freelancers are facing is basically their networks tend to be within their industry. So te television people would know other television people, software people would know other software people. Uh, there are very few, let's say, like fashion designers who are also uh, working with software engineers. Uh, yet for succeeding in these industries, that seems to be required. Um, what do you think is the way that um, maybe policymakers or like in the market, how can we uh, stimulate this kind of cross-discipline collaboration in yeah. creative industries? Thank you. And just sorry, just keep the mic for one second. In, do you agree with me in, in the way I was indicating earlier that that cross-pollination, that interdisciplinarity is going to create a lot of cultural and economic value if we get it right? Is that your view as well? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I've spent three years working in, in this field and I found that um, it's basically like inevitable that that's like either people will work together and kind of create this new value or uh, they just won't be able to do anything in this field. Um, so, yeah, yes. so that's quite, I mean, what you've just said is quite frightening, actually. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a good, you've given us a warning. Um, so if we don't improve interdisciplinarity in our education system, and a more broad-minded view. And if we don't 
uh, develop curricula that have that wider view. In fact, we were talking earlier, where some, I've been to various meetings and had various conversations on campus today, and I can't remember all of them. Um, I mean, which order they happened in and who I was talking to. But um, uh, I wrote a book about five years ago called The Empathy Instinct. Um, and an element of it, never mind what the book was about, well, it was about empathy, but um, is the, the, the medical students. Now, most medical courses have got elements of arts and culture in them because medics need to understand how to tell and, and hear stories. And you don't work well with patients if you don't understand human narrative. And also you need to be empathetic and therefore uh, you can develop your empathetic gene with um, uh, human storytelling, which is what you get with arts and culture. Um, and so that's, you know, the fact that there are now courses in film storytelling and other things in various medical courses now just to develop that human element rather than the more scientific mechanistic element um, is, is interesting to me. And so that would be an example. It suddenly occurs to me as I'm thinking out loud. But we need so much more, don't we? I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. If we could come forward, please, to Nancy and then Vian. So thank you both. Um, two, two brief comments. Firstly, storytelling is really important in science as well, yeah. if you're going to sell your idea. And secondly, just on popular culture, I'm just delighted that um, at our John Ryland's library, which was very ancient, hosts the British Pop Archive, which brings a very different audience. <laughs> but I wanted to raise something that we've talked about before, but I think the problem is still there, and we've touched on it in various different ways, and that is our school curriculum and education. It forces a division. Are you going to do sciences? Are you going to do economics and business? Or are you going to do something creative? And how can we broaden that curriculum to make it more inclusive so you don't force choices at quite an early age to go down a route that shuts off the rest? And that's the vice chancellor of one of our greatest universities talking. And, and that's really important that people like you say that. It's wonderful you have just said that. Nancy. I think we have a long way to go, actually. Um, we have a long way to go, um, not only in stopping that sort of CP Snow thing, uh, but we have a long way to go, too, in, um, as I uh, alluded to earlier, in um, just uh, broadening the skills we're giving the next uh, generation, you know. We talked earlier in the session we have with your postgraduate students. Um, I asked them in the room which of them felt in their education up to now, and I guess they're all in their early to mid-twenties, that, that group, uh, felt they had had creativity encouraged or even um, taught to them at any point in there. And they were challenged to think of examples, weren't they? They couldn't say. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's so important that people have got this uh, ability to invent and create and innovate uh, in the future going forward. Things are moving so fast, you know, we are in the early years of industrial revolution. Let's remember, let's look at a broad thing. You know, when we look back in 100 years' time, this will be the early 20-year, you know, the internet digital revolution, the industrial revolution. Things are changing so rapidly. And we've got to give kids new skills. So we've got to not just not uh, you know, stop them being siloed. We've got to come up with um, uh, softer skills in school as well. And if I can come back on that as well. Um, and thank you very much for raising that. That is absolutely the key question. Um, I think it's uh, the division of disciplines and the, the keeping creativity apart from other disciplines is is a symptom of arch conservatism and and also um, I'd like to remind some of us who were there at the time um, that there was uh, not, yeah, not to have policy amnesia there was a, an incredible experiment by uh, under the Labour government in the uh, nine, 1990s and 2000s into creative partnerships in school where a huge investment into various it's place-based investment it was about bringing creatives and artists into schools to take these kind of different soft skills and different aspects of creativity across the curriculum 
It went on for many years. There was one in Manchester and Salford. There were ones all over the country and a huge amount of evidence of the benefits of that investment um, you know, were generated and then it was dropped because it was a policy change and educational reform and we've all seen what's happened over the last few years in creative and cultural education in the UK. So, you know, in, 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 the, in the secondary sector in particular. So, uh, yeah, I can only say let's not have policy amnesia. Let's look at the lessons learned from previous policy interventions and think about how to change the curriculum. Um, so, uh, Bion, uh, do you have, still have a question that you'd like to? There's a gentleman up there. Okay, well, there was uh, somebody yeah. in the middle just here who had his hand up. Thank you. And Thank you. Um, Eric Liebeck uh, from Manchester Institute of Education. Thank you both for the really wonderful discussions and, and sort of following on Abby's um, point about how policy has changed. I'm, I'm always wary of, of these very good ideas when I imagine putting them into practice via government. <laughs> and um, in particular, the need from Treasury for everything to be auditable and measurable and accountable. And, and I wonder, as much as this is about economic growth, is there a challenge in having the creative industries drive its own policy or does it always have to be translated into economics and economists' ideas about what... <laughs> and, and it just makes me think of, there's um, an, uh, an old essay by Patrick Geddes, the Scottish sociologist called John Ruskin, Economist. And he, and he said that because economists can only measure existing values, they can't actually create new values. Um, he says that it's either up to the economist to become an art critic or failing that the art critic must supply his place and become an economist. And I just wanted to say thank you for, for sort of taking on those roles, but it does seem like there's farther to go, certainly at the level of policy. Why don't you respond? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I can as well, but I think you, you know, I think it rings a bell with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think, I mean, uh, uh, somewhat bluntly, I was trying to, you know, trying to get to that really in, in the short response that I had um, time for. And, and it's about thinking, how do we uh, have a different kind of cultural economics? How do we look at the political economies of, uh, you know, the kind of creative ecosystems, the places, uh, the workforce, the networks um, within, you know, that, that generate value in different ways? And uh, there are different models. Um, I was hearing last week at a, an inter international cultural policy conference about the influence of uh, foundational economics um, which came out of Manchester, as I understand it, on thinking about how we think you know, we can separate different types of economies out that help us to understand their value to places and to you know, networks, ecosystems, workforces, and so on. So if you look at um, the way that uh, foundational economics divides um, economies up into four different parts, then creative industries are consistently placed within the kind of more market-based transactional part, whereas actually creative and cultural industries, as I would term them, um, go right across from everyday cultural participation that Andy Miles was talking about earlier, you know, through to the important must-have parts of economies, whether that's nail bars, hairdressers, and so on, um, and then the way that they might help to support public sphere, public space, and, and kind of give us cultural democracy. So I think I, I just can only agree with you, um, Eric, that, that actually thinking about different economic models and not just recurring and returning to the dominant ones is really important. Um, you know, and I think uh, it's not that we don't want creativity and culture to drive, you know, and grow <laughs> our economies, but we want, to do, we want it to happen in the right way and not just be kind of harnessed or constrained by those, those metrics that you refer to. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. <laughs> okay. Very good um, I am aware that I think you were first at the back. Sorry for the person with the mic who needs to go all the way up there <laughs> and then down again to the front. And then I think this must be our, our last question. Um, Evening, Baz. Dave Mutri from... Oh, Hope, Dave, Hope. how are you? I didn't see you there hiding at the back. How are Hiding. things? Uh, well, good, thank you. Lovely to see you. Um, so, um, nice to see you too. Uh, 
I can't remember, I think it was um, uh, a previous chair of the Arts Council said the big trouble with artists is they bite the hand that feeds them. Um, and given the fact that we've seen a steady decline since uh, uh, 2010 uh, uh, in public funding for arts and culture and, and um, the, uh, the, the ongoing um, uh, culture wars we see running across the whole of the broadcast industry and, uh, and, and the arts as well, um, yet there is a need for changing the curriculum, there's a need for continued investment. How do we go over the hump that, that, that perhaps the current um, uh, uh, administration doesn't necessarily see us as allies? Yes. Um, it's really interesting. You know, you know that um, American pollster called Frank Luntz, who does an awful lot of work on Newsnight? Have you, have you seen him, Dave? Do you know who I mean? Uh, there's an amazing piece in The Guardian today. Um, he did a fringe meeting at the Tory party conference uh, yesterday evening. And he told them to give up fighting the culture wars. And, and he gave them a list of words they should stop using, like woke. And by the way, he's a Republican in, in, in America. He's not, a left, he's not on the left. He's quite thoughtful. And he just said to them how it's divisive. And, um, and, and, it, and, and it isn't even to their benefit in the end. Uh, in terms of making themselves more popular or being more in touch or whatever else a politician may wish to be. So, sorry, that's just a sort of topical <laughs> reference. Um, look, uh, there's so many ways of answering your question. Um, does, uh, let me just answer it in one way only, uh, Dave, but I, I could do it in many other ways. Um, when there are conservative governments in power, um, the arts tend to get funded not as well as they do under Labour governments. Uh, and people in the arts are more likely, in my experience, to have points of view that are probably left of centre than right of centre. That's not universal, it's just a generalisation. Uh, and in many ways, that's sort of how it should be, because they're the sort of people who should be challenging stuff more. And so it's not that surprising. There'll be many exceptions to this, by the way. But one of the things I found when I was chairing the Arts Council was how could I get everybody in the arts world to make the points they wanted to make uh, and try and take the politics out of it. In other words, not to, us, not to just say, um, you know, you bastards, give us more money. It's typical of you, you're trying to take the money away, but to engage in proper dialogue um, that doesn't sound party political, but sounds really engaged in the arts issues, not, not the political issues. Now, it's very difficult to divide them, but if you know what I'm getting at, and only because when politicians think you're listening to them and you don't necessarily hate them, they do things for you. And actually, um, when I was chair of the Arts Council, and you said arts funding has declined since 2010, well, it sort of has and it sort of hasn't. It certainly got, as we know, extremely challenged during COVID. But actually, while I was at the Arts Council, you know, Dave, something rather interesting happened. They put in those huge cuts just before I went to the Arts Council in 2010-11, the austerity of the coalition government. Um, and over the four years um, George Osborne was Chancellor, we, we gently seduced him, the MP for Tatton. Uh, we got, sent people to see him who smiled at him. It turned out he had a en genuine enthusiasm for the arts, which he did. Um, and we got him to bring in tax credits, as, as you know, tax credits for theatres, tax credits. They were, never mind about the name, because it's, they're not tax credits, really. They're just bungs, but that's good. Um, and um, do you know the tax credit system replaced the money that he'd cut from the, the arts funding, almost pound for pound? And we sort of did it by stealth. Um, so, I look, that's not probably the answer you were looking for, but I find it very interesting... Um, the relationship between people working in arts and culture when there's a right of centre government in power. Uh, I actually believe they can work together, but I think it, it demands a great deal of subtlety. <laughs> I think, um, thank you, I think that we'll have to leave it there, and apologies to our final questioner, um, uh, and we'll have to leave it um, on the subtle note? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my response would be, we need more policy innovation yes. like, like that that you've just described. And also we need to keep going local. You know, it is, you know, culture is practiced good. in a situated way. 
uh, so is creativity. So um, without further ado, we'll close for this evening. Thank you, everybody, for your comments you. and questions. And uh, a massive thanks to Sir Peter Basil.